three. Welcome to Arts and Leisure on the HAN Network. This is our weekly program featuring everything that is coming up in the area's music, arts, and entertainment scene. We will interview local artists, authors, musicians, and even some nationally recognized names who may be performing here in our area. We will have movie reviews and film suggestions from the real dad, Mark Schumann, and etiquette tips from Catherine Michaels. This is your all-access pass, and here are your hosts, Arts and Leisure editor Sally Sanders and our entertainment reporter, Steve Coulter. Welcome to Arts and Leisure on the HN Network. I'm your host, Steve Coulter. We've got a great edition today. We're going to be talking about Netflix's series, Stranger Things. But first, we have Phil Hall, Fairfield author, whose new book is coming out on August 8th. The title of that is In Search of Lost Films. Phil, welcome to the couch in Arts and Leisure. Thank you for having me here, and I hope you don't mind the way I'm dressed a little too leisurely. But it's Hey, it's outside. summertime. Yeah. It's understandable. It's, what, 90 <laughs> degrees out there? 95. In 95. Ah. Yeah. And so this book comes out in a couple of weeks, but how did this journey start? How long have you been researching these lost films? And for people that don't know about the history of lost films well, in I've been a film writer for three decades, and I've written a great deal about film history. And one of the problems in writing about film history is there are a lot of missing links within uh, the development of film, within the careers of many filmmakers and film stars. And it became obvious that it's just so much of movie heritage has been lost. And there have been several books on lost films in the past, but over the past five or so years, there have been a lot of previously lost films that have been recovered. So I figured this would be a good time to do a new book on the yeah, subject. start the conversation again. Start it again, and also to expand it as well, because previous books on lost films tend to focus on silent movies, particularly those made in the United States. And there's actually, something that goes to the 70s, right? Yes. Yeah. Actually, there are films that have been made as late as the 1970s that have disappeared. Right. And so I wanted to encompass the full cinematic spectrum, and not just in, in American films, but also films from overseas. Well, there are not just films that are lost, but pieces of films. When, when a film was first created and then edited, what was left on the cutting room floor, which may be of, of great interest, they don't keep them. Is well, that right? Well, not anymore. Uh, with the advent of home video, they were able to keep the deleted sequences for special features. Mm -hmm. But going back to the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, even into the 60s, or even into the 70s for that matter, uh, there was no market for deleted scenes. What was what Someone was, just swept them yeah. up yeah. off the well, floor. There was no reason well, to... Well, just uh, academic to, interest more than It wasn't seen that way. No, yeah. because there were several reasons why films disappear. One of the problems is storage. I mean, so many films are made, where are you going to put all of them? And if these are uh, films or if these are scenes from films that have no perceived commercial value, why keep them? At yeah. least that was the thinking back then. Well, and the other problem with early films w was the deterioration and the flammability, right? Yes, the early films prior to 1950 were um, shot on something called nitrate film. And the beauty of nitrate film is when you project it on the big screen, it looks gorgeous. That's why films became so popular so quickly because when you would go to the, uh, the theater back in the day, the movies looked, uh, looked amazing. The problem with nitrate film is in storage. Uh, if it's improperly stored, either it deteriorates into a dust or to goo, or if it's stored in uh, situations like we have outside today, where we're too warm, and humid, yeah. uh, it bursts into flames. <laughs> and so many uh, films, historically significant films, literally went up into flames because of poor storage. Without giving too much away of your book, what are some of the movies that you found that are lost? And who are some of the directors? I know there's some big names in oh, it. Yes. There's Hitchcock, there's Alfred Kubrick. Hitchcock's um, film, the, uh, the Mountain Eagle, which was one of his first films, has disappeared. Uh, Orson Welles had a lot of uh, his footage was lost. Uh, the Magnificent Ambersons was cut up uh, while he was out of the country, and the footage that was taken out has disappeared. Uh, Orson Welles also started a film version of his play, Moby Dick, rehearsed in 1955. It was never finished, and uh, the footage has disappeared. It was last seen uh, at a production company in London in the 60s that didn't want to pay uh, a tax on it, so it was uh, taken back by the customs office and nobody saw it since. Uh, the first Marx Brothers movie was a silent movie called Humorisk, made in 1921, and that, uh, that doesn't exist anymore. You mentioned Kubrick. Uh, in Dr. Strangelove, the original ending was a massive pie fight. And I find that unbelievable. Yeah, <laughs> it was. And uh, the pie fight footage uh, is believed to have been destroyed by Kubrick. Uh, at least that's where, where most of the scholarly consensus is. I'd like to imagine it was preserved someplace. But uh, yeah, that's also. You have to explain a little more about the pie fight, though. You can't just, <laughs> there. Okay, well, you the, can't just drop no. that nugget and get the away end, with well, it. Well, the end of uh, Dr. Strangelove, everyone's in the war room. and. Right. 
it, uh, there's a whole buffet of, uh, the buffet table of pies, it's like a Three Stooges film, and uh, the Americans and the Russians start throwing pies at each other, and the different military branches are throwing pies at each other, and it becomes a big gooey mess. I kind of like that ending. It's, it's, <laughs> the problem was, uh, apparently, it, it could only be filmed once because there was so many pies and they just didn't have uh, the budget to do it over and over. And it just didn't work. It didn't fit the, uh, what Cooper was trying to do. And it was also, there was one line in the, uh, the pie fight sequence where Peter Sellers' president uh, gets knocked down by a pie and somebody yells out, the president is down. And this, was, uh, this film was finished at the time of the Kennedy assassination, so that was considered ah. to be in bad taste. Mm. So uh, they got rid of all the pies and they just uh, reshot the ending with what we have today, a lot less gooey and a lot less slapsticky, but it's, uh, it's still an effective ending. Now, is that the most influential movie in terms of, you know, people still watch Doctor Strangelove today that you found in your research, or is there another example of, of something that's a cl considered a classic that... Well, The Wizard of Oz yeah. is the most obvious. Uh, the Wizard of Oz began, uh, it was directed by a man named Richard Thorpe, and in that version, Buddy Epson was the Tin Man, and Judy Garland's Dorothy actually had blonde hair. She looked more like a, like a, a young Lindsay Lohan than a little girl from Kansas. And the footage, uh, apparently, it just wasn't working. They were the, Mervyn Leroy, who was the producer, was complaining that it just wasn't clicking. And then Buddy Epson got dreadfully sick because of the makeup he was using it was made with aluminum paste, which he inhaled and coated his lungs, so he had to go to the hospital. Uh, Mervyn Leroy shut down the production. Jack Haley replaced Buddy Epson as uh, the Tin Man. And uh, Dorothy's makeup and hair was changed, so she looks as she does in the film that, uh, that was The completed. only way we've ever seen her. Yes. <laughs> so all of the footage that was shot before the production was shot down um, was, uh, was thrown out. We have a couple of photographs, uh, but that's all we have to work with. And also as the film progressed, there were several numbers that were taken out of the film. Uh, the most famous was the Jitterbug number, when Dorothy and her friends are going through the woods to go to the, uh, the witch's castle. Uh, the witch sends, she, it's in the film, she says send a bug ahead to take the fight out of them. And that bug was the jitterbug, which causes them to, uh, to dance crazy. <laughs> that, that was taken out of the film. There was a reprise of Over the Rainbow, which Dorothy sang in the witch's castle, that was taken out. And there was a reprise of Ding Dong, The Witch is Dead. It was a massive number where it begins at the witch's castle after her demise and it goes back to Oz. And all of that was taken out except for maybe three seconds for the coming attraction. If you, you see the coming attraction on YouTube for The Wizard of Oz, you'll see uh, a tiny fragment of that uh, sequence. That's all that remains. What's the most challenging aspect of hunting down something that isn't there? Like, trying to describe it, because yeah. how do you describe something you can't see? Right. So you have they, to go... You can't find. You're no. in search of something that's literally untraceable. So you have to go through historic records. You have to go through uh, the reviews of the day whatever still photos might be available to determine. A lot of these films, uh, there aren't even pictures of the films. We don't mm -hmm. know what uh, the actors look like or what the sets look like. So newspaper accounts are a big part of that, I would think. That was uh, very, very helpful, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was amazed that <laughs> among the, the places that, that lost films have been found was buried in the Yukon? Yes, there was uh, up in the Yukon. There was, uh, they were going to be, I think it's around 1978, they were clearing out uh, land to put up some sort of a complex. And apparently there had been a parking lot that at one time was a swimming pool. And the town, I think it was the town of Dawes in the Yukon, had no further use for the swimming pool, but they had a whole bunch of uh, old films from the, the local cinema, which they didn't need anymore because the silent film era was over and people wanted to see sound movies, but these were old silent films, so they just dumped them in the abandoned swimming pool and paved it over. And as luck would have it, the permafrost preserved these films. Oh my! These gosh. were nitrate films. These were nitrate films, and so when they started to excavate the uh, the parking lot, all of a sudden there's this huge swimming pool full of films. What a treasure! Yeah, yeah that is thing. that is too cool. Was that your favorite story in your research? Oh, God, there are a lot of yeah. uh, wonderful stories in there. Um, I interviewed filmmaker Robin Lung, who had tracked down a movie called Kukan, which was the first documentary feature film to win the Academy Award. That was 1941. And by the end of the 40s, the film was considered lost, and she was able to uh, find a copy of the film, and it's now being preserved by the Motion Picture Academy in Hollywood. Very cool. Now, the Motion Picture Academy is, is doing its, its preservation. MoMA yes. has a, a big uh, film preservation Library program. of Congress, Library. George Eastman House, uh, British Film Institute, all over the world. Now, uh, there's a, a big movement to preserve as many films as possible. Are they digitizing them? 
Well, a lot of the films are still on nitrate. That's the problem. There's not a lot of money to preserve these films. So first they have to get the films from nitrate to safety stock, and then they would take it over to being digitized. But it's a very time-consuming process, yes. and it's a very costly process. In terms of your process, how long have you been writing this book for? Uh, the book took two years to complete. Uh, I'm actually a year behind schedule on it because the research was so extensive, and I kept finding stuff that I hadn't heard of before. And I needed to track down a lot of information and confirm it was correct before I could get it to the publisher, which is Bear Manor Media. And fortunately, the publisher was very, very patient with me, even though I was a year late uh, in handing it in. It's got to be perfect, like a, like a good film. You have to have every sequence. Well, you know, shot I could, I could actually keep. I could still be researching it now if yeah. I wanted to, because it's such an expansive subject. And I, I figured enough is enough. It has to come to an end sooner or later. And so I, I decided uh, just to get it done. Granted, it was a year late, but I wanted just to get it done and get it to the publisher, because otherwise I could still be home doing research. Right. Yeah, and and we should point out too that it's it's indexed, which is. Yes. So helpful to anybody who's doing further research or wants to look something up. That's correct. Um, one of the great stories in, in this book, too, is, is um, about Naughty Dallas. Yes. Which, which is just, it's like one of those amazing coincidences. Lord, uh, yes, Larry Buchanan was a filmmaker out of Texas. He made exploitation films, and he wanted to do a film about strippers. Now, in Dallas in the early 60s, the big uh, strip joint was the Carousel Club, which was owned by Jack Ruby whose name should be familiar oh, to yeah. the story. <laughs> the, the Jack Ruby. Yeah. And Larry Buchanan wanted to use Ruby's girls, but they couldn't shoot it in the Carousel Club because uh, very low ceilings and the lighting wouldn't be very good. So he had a quandary. How can he, he use Ruby's girls without actually using the club? So he shot basically phony footage in the club to pacify Ruby, and Ruby was on camera for two days playing himself. And uh, Buchanan just used that as a ruse to... Uh, contract the girls so they could go to another location and shoot the, the proper movie. And so he shot Ruby's footage and he figured, well, I'm not going to be using this. And so he threw this out. And uh, about maybe six months to a year later, uh, President Kennedy was killed. And there were suddenly inquiries as to whether the footage that was jettisoned included Ruby meeting with Lee Harvey Oswald. Because some people insisted that uh, that was the evidence the two of them actually knew each other. Yeah. So the there was a piece of lost history. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say, now that is a yeah. piece of lost history right there. Well, it turned out that uh, Oswald was not in Dallas at the time that uh, the film was being shot. But still, it's a great story. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, this is your sixth book. Seven. Seventh. Sorry. Okay. You've written the greatest bad movies of all time. Yes. What's your favorite bad movie? Or what's your My least, least favorite? My least favorite uh, <laughs> film. It's a film called Ronaldo and Clara. It was made in 1976. It was directed by Bob Dylan. It was his only attempt at making a film, and it's a four-hour unwatchable mess. <laughs> I mean, there's some nice music here and there, but you're watching the film, you have absolutely no idea what's going on at all. And even Dylan was embarrassed by the film, and he had, uh, he had it withdrawn from release, and it's never been available on any home entertainment format. It was once broadcast, maybe by accident, I think, on British TV, <laughs> and there have been countless bootleg videos based on that broadcast. It's the only way you can see the movie today. Oh, man, that's too bad. I would love to just sit down for <laughs> 10 minutes And while yeah. in... Uh, you could find it online. There are plenty of sites yeah. selling the bootleg. Was that yeah. the hardest book you've had to write in research? Or it no? was fun and it was not fun. Uh, it was fun because you're, you're finding films that some of them are so bad that they're hilarious and some of them are just so bad that you want to shoot yourself. <laughs> and you also... I also feel bad uh, criticizing uh, people. As a writer, especially as a film writer, I'd like to uh, be more positive and encourage people to see a good movie right. as opposed to uh, trashing a film and saying, oh God, this is so terrible, you, ha you can't believe this. Because nobody wants to go see a bad movie. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, we go to the movies to be entertained and yeah. be happy, right? Not yeah. to be assaulted. Yeah. And now you've also done a book on independent filmmaking, is that right? I did a, uh, my first book was about the history of underground films. I did a film about independent film distribution and the history of independent cinema. And so you've always been fascinated behind the history of movie making. Yeah, I love watching movies, everybody does, but I've always been curious, well just uh, how did this film get made? Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing led to another and uh, here I am on book number seven. How have you seen as a movie critic for the last three decades, how have you seen the industry change? Uh, it's changed for better and worse. Uh, there's a lot more people making films, which is good. It's also a problem because a lot of the people making films today aren't really qualified to be making them, particularly independent films. Uh, the business of the industry has changed because uh, it's so expensive now to make films and to make a profit back that you have to 
uh, go with vehicles that are going to be sure fire You have to have hits. Thor and yeah, Iron so, Man. So you have comic book films and you have reboots of old vehicles. I saw a trailer online that's going to be a new King Kong film next yep. year. So, oh my God, why? Yeah, why? Yeah, why? <laughs> why do we need that? Brie Larson, Oscar winner, is going to be in it. Yeah, but the interesting thing in the Lost Films book, there are two King Kong movies that are lost, and they were made in Japan in the 30s, and they were made without the permission of RKO Studios. So these were sort of bootleg versions of King Kong, which Hollywood had no idea these ever existed. Unfortunately, they don't exist anymore. We only have uh, a couple of pictures, and they look like very, very strange movies. How, lo how long did it take you to get used to, like, because if I was writing it, I would just, every time I find a, found a movie, I would just think to myself, it's crazy that they just disappeared like that. How many times I did you say that, and, I got and when did you get it. used to it? Yeah, I got numb to it because I realized there was so much carelessness right. over the years that this shouldn't be a surprise. What really surprised me was just how many significant films are gone. Uh, we have early uh, sound films are gone, early feature films, early 3D films, early widescreen films. Uh, the first animated feature length film, both silent and sound, are gone. Uh, early films from India, Japan, from Latin America, from South Africa, they're gone. Uh, it's, it's astonishing. It's like, imagine you go to a museum and half of the, uh, the frames don't have pictures in them. That's film history. Yeah. That's crazy. Well, Phil, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, the name of the book is In Search of Lost Films. It's on bookshelves August 8th. You can get it at uh, bearmanormedia.com or any bookstore, is that right? Amazon? Amazon, barnesandnoble.com, the, the whole uh, usual nine yards. Yeah, and it's definitely worth a read if you're into the history of filmmaking. Uh, Phil does a great job. Thank you again so much for coming on the couch, and uh, maybe we'll have you back on soon to talk about your next book. And maybe in cooler weather, so I'll be dressed properly. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. We're going to cut to our uh, first commercial break, and we come back on, we're going to talk about Netflix's Stranger Things. Walter Stewart's Market in New Canaan is your time-saving local shopping destination for the best of spring. Find many of your favorite products, from great specials on everyday items to the freshest organic produce, artisanal cheeses, and grass-fed steaks. Drop off your knives to be sharpened, grab a beautiful bouquet of spring flowers, and stop in next door for a wine tasting. Plus, their personal staff is always ready to lend a helping hand. So stop in to Walter Stewart's Market, 229 Elm Street, today, or shop online at stewartsmarket.com. Mosquitoes, ticks, gone. Guaranteed. That's what Mosquito Squad guarantees as America's most trusted mosquito and tick control company. Locally owned and operated, over 90,000 homes have been protected by Mosquito Squad using their dual protection method for season-long protection, which includes barrier spray service for eliminating mosquitoes and adult ticks, as well as supplemental programs to increase tick control. They use only USDA organic options, which are safe and non-toxic. Contact them today at www.squadctny.com or 203-893-4309. Mosquito Squad. No bugs, no bites, no kidding. Warm weather, light breezes, boats are in the water. There's no better place to celebrate summer than the Dock Shop. Whether in Darien at 51 Tokenique Road or Westport at 609 Riverside Avenue, the Dock Shop is where you'll find everything you need to kick off summer. From the latest summer apparel to the newest fishing tackle, the Dock Shop will help you get the most out of your next beach day or harbor cruise. At the Dock Shop, you'll find a wonderful selection of items made in the USA and right here in New England, all with a distinct nautical flair. Boater, beach bum, fisherman, or simply love the coastal lifestyle, this is a unique place to shop. DockShop.com. You're watching the HAN Network, and you're not alone. More than 1.5 million viewers have watched our live sports, news, and entertainment broadcasting since the network launched in August 2015. Advertise on the network that reaches Fairfield County, Connecticut's most engaged audience. Contact Advertising Director Jessica Murren at 203-273-7312 or email jessica at han.network. You're watching. Welcome back to Arts and Leisure on the HN Network. Sally and I are joined on the couch with Eric Gendron, our director. How are you doing, Steve? And our resident yeah. uh, kind of TV comic Guru. book. You can say nerd. It's okay. No, it's my lower third. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to be talking about Netflix's Stranger Things, yes. which it Very was released exciting. on uh, July 15th, and it's been kind of the summer sensation. Very exciting. I was totally taken by surprise by this Biggest show. Biggest surprise I've seen. Really? Yeah, yeah, they released the trailer probably two, three weeks before it came out. I saw it, saw the trailer probably a week before it came out. I'm like, where did this come from? I didn't hear anything about Winona Ryder and 80s nostalgia and yeah. stuff. And and uh, and watched the trailer, and I was immediately like, 
oh my god, I, this is going to be my favorite show of the year. Even before watching a single moment of it, it was just based on the trailer. I knew I was setting myself up for for disappointment, but it exceeded all my expectations. Right. Now, did you watch it all in, in one sitting? <laughs> no, I, I probably could have. I mean, and I actually had to, my, my wife made me wait a few days because we were still in the middle of uh, Daredevil and uh, what else were we watching? There was a, we were in the middle of like, two different shows. Right. Like, no, let's finish those two shows and then watch the two things. I'm like, no, I want to watch it now. <laughs> but, so we did finish the two things and then we watched the whole thing in, in about four days. And for those who don't know, it's set in 1980s. Yes. It's very much a throwback in to... Indiana. In Indiana. In Indiana. Hawkins, yep. Indiana. Yep. And which it's... may or may not be made up, is it? I'm not <laughs> sure. I actually haven't looked into that. Fictional uh, town in yes, Indiana. Yes. Probably a fictional town in I Indiana. Would there's think. fictional yeah. monsters. There's all and sort of telekinesis. Yes. And a young boy goes missing. Uh, he's the son of Winona Ryder's character, and they're looking for him everywhere. And you come In to dark woods with flashlights. Yes. And you come to find out that supernatural forces have taken him. And this isn't a spoiler, Kate. We no don't, worry. but we don't know that at first. All we know is that there's you see a, a monster in the first. Scene. Yes, yeah. yeah. You can at you first, can kind of tentacle. infer yeah. exactly that supernatural. And then so his friends go looking for him. They're all like eleven. And years you've got old. Matthew Modine lurking in yes, the darkness. Yes, Matthew Modine yeah. is, the, is, the, is the kind of is the human villain, right? Yeah. <laughs> and um, and and then his three friends all go looking for him, and they come across this young girl in in the woods. Who has a mysterious yeah. past? Whose name is Eleven? Yes, who may or may not have superpowers. Right. So it's it's a one got everything setup. you want in a, in yes. a TV show. Well, so and I have to say, I love the way it o it opens with the kids playing Dungeons and yes. Dragons. Yep. And then riding their bikes. If they had baskets on the front of them, yep. you know, and wore hoodie sweatshirts, it would have been perfect. Well, let, let's let's just jump right into it because yeah. you know, I mean, you know, the the premise alone and the scripts alone, you know, make it for a great show, but. How lovingly crafted this series is! Right by Matt and Ross Duffer, the yes, brothers, Duffer brothers, who and uh, also Sean uh, Levy should yes. get credit because I just watched the wonderful third episode. Yes. He was the director of that yep. one. Yeah, yeah they, and they that leaves of, you hanging. That <laughs> kind of yeah, they both kind of share the director uh, directorial um, yeah. uh, chair for the for the se for the entirety of the series, but. You know, it, so the thing it's obviously really garnering is a lot of sp comparisons to Spielberg and a ton. You know, you, uh, w and for the good reason, the monster yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's just like Jaws. It's, it's like every episode you get a little yep. bit more of the monster. Yep, and it does you know a fantastic job of teasing out the monster, teasing out the power, using the kids effectively, and also even the framing of the shots. I mean, I was just I went back and watched the f uh, like you know kind of scrubbed through the first three episodes, mm -hmm. then watch them in, in their entirety again. But um, scrubbed through, and you know there's a lot of those you know the low shots that Spielberg does. You know where you got the kind of the, oh, hero, yeah. the hero shot, you know, with David Harbour's sheriff character walking. Right, and David Harbour is playing the character like Kyle Chandler, Chandler played in Super 8, but he's doing a ten times better talk job. Talk about a, yeah. you know, a, a, a breakthrough for a guy, you know, because like, you know, go look at his IMDb page, and right. like, dude's been in a ton of yes, stuff. Yes, we were just talking on he's the ride up. We yeah. never really knew who he was, right. and yeah. I feel like this is going to be the thing that really breaks him out and into, into something bigger. And you know so. he probably wasn't their first pick, but perfect for the role. Yep. He, he really oh, he killed it. Yeah, he yeah. killed it. And the, and the kid, the kid actors are just amazing. Amazing. Every one amazing. of them. Amazing. Millie, uh, Millie Brown, who plays Eleven, right. is... You got Phil, Finn Wolfhard, which yes. is a great name. Great he name. He plays Mike, yes. and then there's yeah. Dustin and Lucas, played by yeah. Gatton, Matarazzo, Matt and Ma Caleb. Matarazzo, yeah. Yes, Matarazzo. Gain Matarazzo uh, steals the show. He's, yeah. he's kinda, just he's, like when he, he's when he gets the, his He's kind of the truffle shuffle kid from Goonies. Yeah, he's... Yeah, he is... He is hilarious, but uh, Millie Brown absolutely steals the show. She's all the kids are actually twelve years old, and Millie Brown is going to be a star. She's, yeah. she's British, which, you is, which you can't yeah. you can't tell. And well, she, was she in, doesn't say she, too much. No, that's <laughs> true. But she does so much acting with her face and her, her eyes. eyes which just her really eyes. Her eyes are really unbelievable. good. Unbelievable. She was in a show called Intruders before this, mm -hmm. uh, which was a BBC show. She was on an um, NCIS episode. Yes. I saw her on yeah. Yeah. One TV. only one yeah. episode. Yeah. But um, this this girl is something else, and we're going to be hearing her name for a long time. And just the amount of acting that she's able to do with her face. That's at her few, age, too. at her age, is is, is really incredible. It's I so hope impressive. Winona Ryder gives her some some um, advice on on dealing with fame early. And, I yes, you know yes. I, I hope Winona's learned her lesson first of all. <laughs> 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 well, she settled in comfortably to the yes. No, I, mother, I am I loving like. Winona's kind of recent uh, renaissance, starting with Star Trek, and, yeah. and, yeah. Uh, and recently with she was um, in Show Me a Hero. Show Me a Hero. Year. She was fantastic. In, yeah. so. um, it's nice to see her back. Yes. So yeah, no, I have been. I am absolutely obsessed with Stranger Things, and it's actually um, 
my background on my do you, phone. Do you have a favorite character? Is it, what do you say, 11? Probably 11. Is I think my favorite character, now, so. people are going to hate me, is Steve. I think he's great. Steve is I think actually a very interesting <laughs> character. Steve you, is the boyfriend? The boyfriend, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sleaze Bucket Steve. <laughs> <laughs> he, you know, I, I, you know, I don't want to give anything away, but he, he is not the he's traditional, yeah. he's not the traditional jock character. In, in the classic 80s. No, you, know, you can tell that he's got a little uh, no, he's, insecurity he's a little kind of he, he, has, he has an arc. He's not, you yeah. know, he's not an archetype. Yeah. He actually does have a character arc, which yeah. is really nice. But, um, but what has really amazed me about Stranger Things is that it really does feel like an eight-hour film mm -hmm. as opposed to a television show. It, it really ha is so cohesive throughout, and you, it really is the latest and greatest example of auteur television. Auteur right. television, I think, is is a, a term I came across recently. It was an excellent article with Steven Soderbergh, You're right. who was from the Nick, who was talking about his own show, The Nick, which is uh, was on Cinemax and now it's kind of gone over to HBO. It's a weird deal. That's it's going brilliant on. for people yes. who haven't seen that because it's like the camera is a character in its own. Exactly, and that's kind of the defin. You know, the, I don't know the definition, but you know that is a big thing about auteurism is that the director kind of becomes a character. Yeah, and you know when you're talking about you know Scorsese and De Palma in the '70s. You know, and then Soderbergh with Sex Lies and Video Tapes. Yep, and, and, the late, and then, you know, and then two, two more flamboyant sense. You know, Wes Anderson and Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> um, you know, they kind of take off. Is Wes Anderson going to do TV? That would be great. That would be amazing. <laughs> that would be amazing. But you know, but Soderbergh talking about you know being able, you know, kind of going back to the, our previous interview that we, we right. had uh, on. Um, you know, how he was talking about um, how movie studios need a sure thing. And so Steven Soderbergh was talking about that people, you know, the, where people went, kind of went to indie films in the 90s to do really weird and expressive things. Or Try really to find their Pulp Fiction. Mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah, we saw like seven different types it's, of Pulp Fiction. Exactly. It's now kind of become television. Yep. And the, the names that are, you know, starting to do really interesting things, you know. And Kerry Fukagima oh, with uh, True Kerry Detective. Fukunaga, yeah. Of, yeah, sorry, of, of, yeah, name. Of, uh, of True Detective. I mean, th that, that first season of True Detective where you had that through line where he directed Every episode. Right. I mean, that is so rare. But you it, see it again with Sam Esmeal. Exactly. Bad I was going to get into that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Where you had that through line, I think really helped the you know not only the production but the performances from Matthew McConaughey and Woody Harrelson. Oh, absolutely. And then and now you have you know a, a singular vision from one person. I mean, we had we've had you know we've had showrunner television for the last you had, years. Look, yeah. the best example I think is Lost. You had yeah. You had over a hundred episodes of Lost. You had, I think, they had twenty different directors, yes. and they had showrunners in Carlton Cuse yeah. and Damon Lindelof, who were great writing the show. But the directors, every episode, exactly. it was directed by a different person. Exactly. So no yeah, cohesion. At it all. kind of show, showrunner television kind of was rose with The Sopranos and West Wing, exactly. with Matt Weiner and and Aaron Sorkin. Right. And you know where you had David uh, Chase too. Yes. Right. Yes. That's yeah, true. Yeah. But yes. they had a vision. Yes. There was a, there was a very singular vision, but they didn't necessarily have their hands on the camera. Now yep. you're seeing Sam Esmail and the Duffer Brothers and Steven Soderbergh um, and Kerry Fukunaga and um, the guy who does Fargo. His name is a Noel Hawley. Yes, Noel Hawley. Um, Who's brilliant. Yes, that really, guy is awesome. really take kind of taking their, you know, putting their hands on, on their product, on their project throughout, throughout its entirety. And that really has led to some very interesting choices. I mean, you look at Mr. Robot, the cinematography in that show and how much how much uh, Kubrick influence is in it, how much Or the uh, drop-off between uh, season one and two of True Detective. Yes, well, that, that, is, a, that, is, a, that is a great the example. Quality because is, is because Carrie was gone, and I mean, he was right. immediately snapped up. You know, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. And that's, do, that do leads me to my things. big question is, what comes next for the Duffer brothers? I mean, you got to <laughs> think, you know, how... You know, lovingly they crafted this because you know I think they're there not going to be little children anymore. There's so a lot. To speak. We're well, that there's a lot of um, nostalgia going, you know, '80s nostalgia going on. But they nailed it so well, and there's so much fun to this that kind of balances the horror of it because this is this is a scary show. Mm -hmm. But you know, this is oh, what about is the end still, of that third episode? Oh, with heroes playing. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. Stop, 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 stop. Uh, stop. <laughs> no spoilers. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, well, they could jump it. You know, they could jump it. Yes. But what, what I was I was thinking more real world for the Duffer Brothers. All right. I f feel that Marvel or DC is going to snatch them up pretty soon. So they'll and do kind feature of become, films. Can yes, they get I, rid of Zack Snyder in uh, sure DC so. and then Good replace Lord. him with the Duffer Brothers? No, I would, oh, I would take that in a second. I please, was thinking about please. that in the second episode. Please, because <laughs> like, these kids. The, I mean, they're not much older than we are. No, you know? I mean, yeah. they're it's crazy. Yeah. Uh, which is making me feel a little, you know, unaccomplished. <laughs> <laughs> but these these guys, they're twin brothers. And hey, you're a director too. 
Uh, yeah, a <laughs> little bit of a different direction, but yeah, sure. Um, but uh, you know, the, to have that singular of a vision for a product that you know does these all these homages to the greatest director of our time mm -hmm. and sticks the landing. I mean, that is a you know a, a explosive no talent to, to really you know burst they, onto the scene. But if they if they sell out basically mm. to to uh, you know DC, mm -hmm. but DC needs them selling. I they know, do. I know. You, you nerd boys, I know you really want them. But but what I'm I'm saying is, what's that going to do to them? Yeah. What's that going to do to them? No, that, and, and I mean Netflix really gives their gives their um, directors writers. Yep. A free hand. Exactly. You know, I, uh, oh. I mean, a prime example is Joss Whedon. I mean, you know, you look how, how well he did with the Avengers, and then he was just devastated by how much the studios manipulated him for Avengers 2. Oh, because for you Ultron. have, there's, there's a guy right here all yep. the time. Yeah. And, and no, that, is that is, like that. I mean, when, and again, it goes back to, you know, when you have the $200 million budget, it has to be a success. But Netflix gives them a pretty good budget. Yeah. No, I don't know how I Netflix does I mean, I remember Jenji Cohen saying that, that yeah. you know, she, she said, well, this is what I'd like to do, and they said, fine. Go all, all the best stuff is coming to Netflix right now. It's, it's yeah. really incredible. And cool. so you think this has taken the kind of de facto TV championship belt away from Mr. Robot? I, it remains to be seen. Yeah, okay. I mean, we're, we're very we're still early in the Mr. Robot okay. season. We're at episode three. Uh, there last night. I didn't actually watch it. I for, totally forgot. Because it's it's um, crazy to think that a, a show could be better than Mr. Robot or Game of Thrones this year. But uh, Stranger Things definitely it's, seems it is to difficult be. to compare Game of Thrones and sure. and and, uh, and Stranger Things. And also Orange is the New Black had a pretty incredible season as well. Yeah. Um, but just from an execution standpoint and a character standpoint and how quickly they were able to make you love these characters, believe their situations, and just be pulled in by the visuals. I mean, the Christmas lights, you know, it was such a cool touch. Yes. You know, the color palette was incredible and all the cinematography, just a complete vision that quickly and in that short amount of time, that, that makes it my, I think, the best show of 2016 so far. We'll see how about Mr. Robot, though. I'm, I'm, I could, I'm very, I'm actually pretty confident that it's going to be Mr. Robot, Stranger Things, when it's all said and done. Right. But, Man, Stranger Things knocked out of the park for first time, really, you know, really first time showrunners. And it's so. worth mentioning too; it's eight episodes, yes. rather than thirteen, which has been the tradition. That was I actually didn't know. I was like, we got to episode six, and I read. I was just starting to read some articles, and it said you only need eight hours. I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, kind of people kind of talked me off the ledge and said, well, you know, they they did. They said what they needed to say in eight hours. They sure. didn't need those five extra episodes to stretch anything out. They didn't need. And they, a, they really kind of won up all these other directors you know, that need the 13 episodes. You look at House of Cards, that could be eight episodes, yeah. and there's five extra episodes. And yeah, and that, and that really drags. Right. And yeah. you might see that happen more often where you I can. Totally because agree, the yeah. Duffer Brothers have already come out and said season two isn't really going to be a second season. They're going to call it a sequel. So they're all, almost treating it as a, a movie. Yeah. yeah. There like, you go. So. They're getting ready for Hollywood. Uh, they, certainly they certainly are. They certainly are. But I cannot wait, and I, I very much hope that. Most, if not all, of the cast is back because they're an incredibly talented group, especially the young ones. So yeah. we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, but those kids are going to be a lot older, and they're going to change a yeah, lot. Yeah, I, I have a feeling there'll be a time jump to uh, yeah. to compensate for that. So, yeah, that's for but sure. we'll see. So I don't want to give anything away to you know for those who haven't seen it yet. But uh, I hope uh, certain character is back. I think you'll know know which one I'm talking about. If uh, so, send in your 9.99 a month. Yeah. Get Netflix. Oh, and watch that, that is the things. easiest ten bucks to spend a month. I yeah. tell you, I got a lot of bills, and then I was like, yes, please. Take shut, up, my, shut up and take my money. Take my ten dollars. <laughs> well, Eric, thank you so much for coming no on problem. and talking about this Always love sensational oh, show. Yep. And we're going to sign off. Everybody have a great weekend. Uh, Stay thank cool. you so much for watching. Enjoy the rain. Arts and Leisure on the HN Network. Welcome to Arts and Leisure on the HAN Network. This is our weekly program featuring everything that is coming up in the area's music, arts, and entertainment scene.